want to talk about creating a God honoring financial legacy. I believe that the best way to do this is to live by what I call the five S's of God honoring stewardship. This is talk about leaving a financial legacy that honors God so that when you leave this earth, the Lord will be pleased with what you did with your stewardship. And by the way, let me help you understand, you are not owner of your money and financial resources. You're the steward of them. God doesn't ask you to give because he wants to shrink your wallet. He asks you to give because he wants to grow your faith. Hello and welcome to Destined for Victory with Pastor Paul Shepard, Senior Pastor of Destiny Christian Fellowship in Fremont, California. Here's something every believer in Christ should remember. We are stewards, not owners. Our time, our money, even our lives are not our own. For the next two days, Pastor Paul will offer five keys to building a financial legacy, one that will honor God while also bringing blessing into our lives beyond all that we can imagine. Stay with us here or stop by PastorPaul.net anytime to hear today's message or any recent Destined for Victory message on demand. That's PastorPaul.net. And let's join him now as he shares today's Destined for Victory message, creating a God-honoring financial legacy. Psalms 90. Let's look again at verses 10 and 12. Here's what it says. The days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength, they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. That's what this is about. Lord, help us to number our days, knowing our days won't go on forever here on earth. Help us to maximize the days we have here on earth that we may apply wisdom to our hearts and to all that we do. So in the opening message of the series, I intentionally caused you to feel rather somber as we talked about the fact that one of these days, all of us are checking out. The mortality rate of human beings is 100%, meaning we're all going to leave. And that's not a fun fact. Nobody has a barbecue and said, let's talk about dying. Those aren't fun facts, but they're necessary facts. Because if you're not ready to die, you're really not ready to keep living. You got to stop and get prepared to die and get that in in view so that as you act between now and your death date, and none of us know when that is, all of those actions will be intentional. That's our point. So last time we talked about building a strong spiritual foundation, which is the most important thing. At the end of the day, Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his or her soul? So it can't be just about money making. It's got to be about being prepared for the inevitable, which is judgment. And so we want to be prepared for that. And I talked about three ways to to build a strong spiritual foundation for your life. We looked at Matthew 633 and remembered it's important to prioritize God's kingdom. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything you need. God will add it to you. But you got to seek first the kingdom of God. Then we talked about uh, aiming to be well pleasing to God. Second Corinthians five and nine, Paul said, so we make it our aim. I'm gunning for my goal is to be well pleasing to God. And finally, we looked at Colossians three seventeen and reminded ourselves that we are to do and say everything that we do and say in the name of of Jesus. And that doesn't mean simply saying the words in Jesus name. I pray when you're praying, for instance, it means everything you do, you do on his authority. You do because it is his will. You do because it is consistent with what he wants you to do, to do and say everything in the name of the Lord. Now, I want to also talk about in this part two, creating a God honoring financial legacy. Before you leave this earth, 
You want to create not only a spiritual legacy that you leave so that people who knew you know that you loved the Lord, but they also know that you were prepared to share your faith with others. And and all of us should be in the business of being a witness so that your your relatives, your friends, your co-workers, everybody knows that is a man, that is a woman, that is a young man, young woman who knew and loved the Lord. If you are a secret agent saint, you need to get out the closet. Do you know everybody else out the closet? What you doing still in the closet? Everybody out the closet. Whatever they are, however freaky they are, freaky, they they freaking all out the closet. Come on, somebody. Nobody's ashamed of what they are. Why we got these few little Christians still sitting up in the closet? Talking about, praise the Lord. No, no, come on out that closet. If you know Jesus, be excited about knowing Jesus. He came to give us life eternal and abundant. Enjoy your life. Don't be a sad Christian. You need to be excited about knowing the Lord. So the spiritual legacy is very, very important that we leave behind. Now I want to talk about creating a God honoring financial legacy. I believe that the best way to do this is to live by what I call the five S's of God honoring stewardship. So if you're taking notes, jot these down. This is talk about leaving a financial legacy that honors God so that when you leave this earth, The Lord will be pleased with what you did with your stewardship. And by the way, let me help you understand. You are not owner of your money and financial resources. You're the steward of them. What's the difference? A steward takes care of what belongs to somebody else. You say, what you talking about? I made this money. You might have made it, but it's not yours. The earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof. And so you got to understand, yeah, you made it, but you're going to give an account to him. When you get a chance, read Matthew 25. Can't take you through it in the interest of time. You'll see the parable of the talents. And Jesus told us that the one who owned everything took a long trip and he left with his servants various amounts of talent. That is capital. To one he left five, to one he left two, to one he left one. And then... He came back after a long time and they were to give an account. That's that's you and I. We got to give an account for what we did with our finances. And, you know, the one with five gave him a 100 percent return. You know that story and heard well done. And the one who was given two gave him a 100 percent return and heard well done. The one who only had one said, well, you see what had happened? And that person was rebuked because instead of using it properly in a God honoring way, they dug a hole and put the talent in the ground. In fact, the owner said, look, why would you do that? You knew I was coming back. You knew you were going to have to give an account. And so I want to make sure none of us are caught with our money having been misused during our lifetime. So let's look at the five S's of God honoring stewardship. I preached these before, but it's important to preach it now in the context of keeping the end in mind. The first way to have a God honoring financial legacy is to sow generously. Sow generously. Proverbs 3, beginning at verse 5. Now, we all know I intentionally started with these verses because everybody knows Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Amen. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He shall direct your path. But look at verses you don't read so much. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Oh, come on, somebody. Trying to humble some of y'all. You think you all that. Don't be wise in your own eyes where you think you smart. He said, fear the Lord and depart from evil. Verse eight. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Look at verse nine. Honor the Lord with your possessions. And with the first fruits of all your increase. Honor the Lord with your possessions, with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. 
What is Solomon saying there? He is saying everything he puts in your hand, you've got to worship him first by giving to the kingdom of God. Honor the Lord with your possessions. Seek first the kingdom. We saw last week, uh, Matthew 633. Seek first the kingdom means you give to the Lord before you give to the mortgage company. Before you give to your landlord. Before you give to the one who's financing your whip. Your car, I'm sorry. It's God you give to him first. And people who fight against tithing and, you know, I still hear them every now and then. The Bible doesn't teach tithing is a mandate for the New Testament. Okay, it's not mandated in the New Testament. What does the New Testament teach you to do? To give generously. You know what generous is? It's more than a tithe. Generous is more like what you give to the mortgage company or the landlord. And the Bible's not even asking you for that. It's just saying be generous. And the tithe is a standard that you see set up in even before the law. Don't tell me tithing is the law. Tithing predates the law. You see tithing in Genesis. Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. Come on. Isaac tithed in a famine. In a famine he tithed. Some of y'all say, I can't afford to tithe. You can't afford not to tithe. Stay with us. The second half of Pastor Paul Shepard's message is coming right up. We want to thank all of you who support Destined for Victory with your prayers and financial support, gifts that help Pastor Paul share the joy of the gospel message with a growing audience. Destined for Victory is supported entirely by friends like you, so please prayerfully consider making a generous gift to Destined for Victory today. Give online safely and securely from our website, pastorpaul.net, or give us a call at 855-339-5500. Again, the number is 855-339-5500. The book of Proverbs tells us that the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. We explore that idea next in the rest of today's message, creating a God-honoring financial legacy. Once again, here's Pastor Paul. But if you're going through a season and you say, Lord, I got myself in a real bad hole and I don't have the faith to give 10. Well, what percentage are you going to give? Give generously and give intentionally to honor God and say, Lord, as soon as you for you who don't have the faith to tithe immediately because of the debt you're in, just say, "Okay, Lord, I'm so sorry. I jacked up my finances, but I'm going to give generously. And once I can, I am going to go on and do everything that's in my heart to honor the Lord with the first fruits. Amen. Amen. And it says with the promise, your barns will be filled. How many know when you take care of God's business, he takes care of yours. He takes care of yours. We got to California and the church could only have 34 people. They could only give me twenty four thousand dollars a year. Twenty four K a year. I had moved to California from Philadelphia and my first rent was nine ninety five a month. I had never heard of such a rent. Back in 1989, I'm coming from Philly. We had a row home in the hood. Crack house cross street, but they shut it down. <laughs> and I had $200 a month mortgage in the hood. I get over here, it's $9.95 a month for some lady I don't even know. And I had to make up my mind. Are you going to practice what you preach? And I decided right then and there, if God brought me to California, I suppose he knows how to pay bills in California. And so that's what I did. I said, okay, we're going to tithe out of this 2000 a month. The church got $200 a month every single month from their pastor. And I was praying that the Lord was going to take care of everything. And he did. And and you need to learn. God's going to take care of you. All right. So the first S is to sow generously. Number two, shrink debt systematically. Shrink debt system. I'm talking about how you can build a God honoring financial legacy. God is honored when you get out of that debt you got yourself into. Hallelujah. You got yourself in. The Lord didn't lead any of us into debt. We led ourselves into debt. Come see, you got to be honest. If you're going to be blessed, please be honest. We got ourselves in debt. You need to know America 
for most of its history, this was not a debt oriented society. Debt did not become normalized until after World War Two. Y'all got to understand a little history. Talk to your grandma, your great grandma, whoever you got, your old folk in your family. Ask them how much they paid for their house and how they paid for their house. They didn't go to the bank. They bought a little house. First, they started out a little renting somebody's room, whatever they had to do. And they put their money together and bought a house. Some of them will tell you, I've talked to some folk in California. I bought this house for 20 some thousand dollars. I said, in California? Yeah, back in the day. Before all this happened. And so you got to understand that wasn't normal for a long time. We've got to get to the place where we stop normalizing what really shouldn't be there. And so shrink the debt you got. Proverbs 22, 7 says the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. Servant. Guess what? When you're in a debt, you're in debt. You're a slave. I know we like servant because servant sounds better. Very often when you see servant in your Bible, it really means slave. And the translators just didn't want to take you there. We are slaves. They own you till you pay them. In some way, they own you. And so we've got to understand the importance of shrinking debt. And there are wonderful ways we're learning from all the Christian financial leaders, uh, Dave Ramsey and, and uh, Money Matters, the guys who, who run the Money Matters ministry. There are several ministries. So you find who helps you. One of uh, our, our friends from First Baptist, uh, Michelle Singletary, uh, my wife and I recently taught a retreat there and she and her husband were there. And, and somebody asked me a question during our session about money. And I answered a little bit. And then after the session, I saw Michelle was there. I said, how come you didn't raise your hand and tell me you were here? I wouldn't talk about money with you sitting out there. She's a columnist that talks about money. Why would I sit up here talk about money and you sitting there? But we got to learn. She can teach you. She's got books. I mean, Michelle, Michelle cold blooded. I mean, she will cut up your your credit card. <laughs> Straight up, say, hand it over. And just I mean, she's first Baptist where she's a member. There are people that, you know, when they when they see the financial stuff coming, they say, oh, Lord, Michelle going to get us. But that's a church that has learned these lessons. As a result, their budget every year is tens of millions of dollars. We're praising God. We are a three million dollar budget church. That's wonderful. We try and do right by a three million dollar budget. They are talking tens of millions of dollars every year. Given to the kingdom of God. When they're building buildings, they'll say, well, it's already some percentage paid for. When they went into their big worship center, I think it was like 60 percent paid for. All that kind of thing. They just built a family life center, 23, 24 million dollars paid for when they walked in. Why? Because they've learned how to discipline their money and let God help them get their act together so that they can be blessed and they can impact the the region for Jesus Christ. We got to do it the same way. So we got to start by getting ourselves out of debt. And we have to learn to delay gratification. Come on, somebody. I know you want to drive nice. But you got to start by driving what you can afford. Your day is coming when you can drive nice. I knew when I got here, one day I'm going to drive nice. But when I got here, I ended up, I came across the country with a car I was paying for because I had a note in Philly. And when I found out I was coming to pastor here, I had a note, had to pay it off here in California. That was one of the things I had to believe God for with that $2,000 a month. 300 of it went to uh, whatever company that was. Dodge, I think it was. Yeah, I had a Dodge Dynasty. Dodge Dynasty. It was nice, but it had like a $300 note out of that $2,000 I was getting and $9.95 already went to this lady. (laughs) So she got her $9.95. The kingdom got $200. You see what I'm talking about? That's almost $1,200 of $2,000. I got $805 left to get through the whole month. Anybody ever had too much month at the end of the money? Too much money. I'm not preaching what I haven't lived. 
too much month at the end of money. And like, okay, Lord, here's all the bills. What you going to do with these? Because <laughs> out of that 805, 300 had to go to Dodge. Now I'm down to 500. We got two kids, five and three years old, just getting ready to start. Just, yeah, they got to eat. And I said, Lord, how are we going to do this? God made a way. He blessed us to put them in Christian school, a tuition Christian school with me making 24K. And my wife and I had decided, she said, baby, we start our family. She said, if you need me to work, we'll figure it out. I said, no, I want you to be able to raise our kids the way my mother was able to raise us. I had a stay at home mother and I was just spoiled like that. I knew the joys of coming home from school and mom's there. And I said to my wife, she was a dental assistant when we got married. But when she was seven months pregnant with Alicia, she uh, left that and she didn't have to go back until she wanted to. And so I said, just go on and raise these kids and God's going, God's going to help us. I don't need you. I'm going to make this happen. And we trusted God the whole way. I'm not telling you what I haven't done. You got to do what you got to do. But in those days, I needed a second car because I got to California. I realized everybody need a car out here. You know, in Philly, you could jump on SEPTA, the public transportation, and go anywhere you want. No, here, you had, I needed a car. And y'all heard the story. I don't have time to tell you. But we asked God for a car. And I started looking for a used car. I said, God, give me something that we can afford and give me the money to buy it. He touched the hearts of some people who were in a prayer meeting. And one day in a prayer meeting, they clear across the country. They said, the Lord told us to start giving money every time we come to our little prayer meeting that they were having in a home. And they started putting money together. And finally, when they had seventeen hundred dollars, they said, let's us ask the Lord what we're supposed to do with it. And somebody said, I believe the Lord wants us to send that to Pastor Paul in California. And they called me and they said, can you use seventeen hundred dollars? I'm telling y'all what God will do. Can you use seventeen hundred dollars? I said, and they told me this story about their prayer meeting. Said we just gather people from a couple of different churches. We just get together and pray. And they told me the little story. And when they asked that question, I said, put it this way. If the Lord is telling y'all to give me seventeen hundred dollars, listen to him. Because he know what he's talking about. So generously shrink debt systematically. Those are the first two keys to creating a God-honoring financial legacy. The next three come your way tomorrow, so be sure to join us. If you need prayer today for your finances, for your family, for any reason at all, the Destined for Victory Ministry team would like to join you in prayer. Visit PastorPaul.net and use the contact feature to share your prayer request with us. While you're there, be sure to sign up for Pastor Paul's monthly letter of encouragement, yours at no cost or obligation. Well, we have a great new resource to share with you today. Not that long ago, Pastor Paul and his wife Meredith conducted a fireside chat at their church, Destiny Christian Fellowship in Fremont, California. For three days, Pastor Paul and Meredith shared wisdom about how to improve and strengthen our personal relationships. Today, we'd like to offer you a booklet that highlights the major themes of their message. It's called Creating a Relational Legacy, and it's our gift to you this month by request for your generous gift to Destin for Victory. Just call 855-339-5500 or visit pastorpaul.net to make a safe and secure donation online. Or mail your gift to Destin for Victory, Post Office Box 1767, Fremont, California, 94538. Again, the address is Destin for Victory, Box 1767, Fremont, California, 94538. Well, just because you have it doesn't mean you've got to spend it. Here's Pastor Paul. What else do you have to do? You've got to save regularly. Saints, Let's realize not everything God puts in your hands now is for now. That's next time in Pastor Paul Shepard's message, Creating a God-Honoring Financial Legacy. Until then, remember, He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. In Christ, you are destined for victory.
What else do you have to do? You've got to save regularly. Saints, let's realize not everything God puts in your hands now is for now. It's a lesson you may have heard all your life. Just because you have it doesn't mean you have to spend it. Hello and welcome to this Friday edition of Destined for Victory with Pastor Paul Shepard. Wherever you are and however you may be listening, thanks for making this part of your day. Well, there are five keys to handling our money God's way. The first is to sow generously. The second is to shrink debt systematically. Today, Pastor Paul talks a little further about this second key idea and then shares the final three steps you can take to honor God in the area of your personal finances. So stay with us now or listen to the broadcast on demand at pastorpaul.net. Again, pastorpaul.net. Let's join Pastor Paul for today's Destined for Victory message, Creating a God-Honoring Financial Legacy. I'm not telling you what I haven't done. You got to do what you got to do. But in those days, I needed a second car because I got to California. I realized everybody need a car out here. (laughs) You know, in Philly, you could jump on SEPTA, the public transportation, and go everywhere you want. No, here you had, I needed a car. And y'all heard the story. I don't have time to tell you. But we asked God for a car. And I started looking for a used car. I said, God, give me something that we can afford and give me the money to buy it. He touched the hearts of some people who were in a prayer meeting. And one day in a prayer meeting, they clear across the country. They said, the Lord told us to start giving money every time we come to our little prayer meeting that they were having in a home. And they started putting money together. And finally, when they had seventeen hundred dollars, they said, let's us ask the Lord what we're supposed to do with. And somebody said, I believe the Lord wants us to send that to Pastor Paul in California. And they called me and they said, can you use seventeen hundred (laughs) dollars? I'm telling y'all what God will do. Can you use seventeen hundred dollars? I said, and they told me this story about their prayer meeting. Said we just gather people from a couple of different churches. We just get together and pray. And they told me the little story. And when they asked that question, I said, put it this way. (laughs) If the Lord is telling y'all to give me seventeen hundred (laughs) dollars, listen to him. Because he know what he's talking about. They sent me that 17. I went up to San Francisco Christian Center. Bishop Green was the pastor there. And uh, he had me come up one Sunday night and preach his Sunday night service. They gave me a $300 offering for preaching. So I had 17 from the prayer folk, 300. And then I, I had 200. I forgot how I saved up the 200. $2,200. God gave me a used car for $2,200. Yeah. It was the second worst car in the church. (laughs) It was a small church, only only about 40 of us at that point. But I had the second worst car in the church. But I was so glad I didn't have the worst car in the church. I said, I'm the pastor. I can't have the very worst car. So God gave me the second worst car. You got to do what you got to do. I said, one day I'm going to drive nice, but right now I got to drive faithful. Oh, this is this going to help somebody. This is going to help somebody. Before you drive nice, drive faithful. And quit trying to wear a hundred dollar hat on a nickel head. <laughs> Come on, somebody. And so you see me now rolling. Don't bother me. I paid my dues. I know there's some branches of Christianity. I, I just don't believe a pastor ought to drive a Tesla. Stop looking at me then. Because <laughs> I love my Tesla. I drive by y'all at the gas station. Because I go in my garage and plug it in. And I'm through. Where am I in this message? Y'all messing with my message. Shrink debt systematically. There are lots of, uh, of ways to do it. You know, Dave Ramsey has the snowball method. And you take your smallest amount that you owe, whatever that bill is, and you pay that off and and all that and just snowball effect. But there are a couple of different ways to do it. Treat your debt like an enemy. It's an enemy. It doesn't mean you well. So you got to shrink debt systematically. What else do you have to do? You've got to save regularly. Saints. Let's realize not everything God puts in your hands now is for now. If you can get yourself into that habit and let me especially dedicate these points in this part of the series to the younger generations. You've heard me talk about there are seven generations alive in America today. 
And uh, I'm in the third of them. Some of y'all too, don't look at me. (laughs) Baby boomers. There are four generations under us baby boomers. I want to say to everybody born after 1965, 65 to 80 is Gen X. And then you have the uh, 81 to 1996, that's Gen Y or millennials. And notice, we used to always say the young people were millennials and act like they were the same. Millennials aren't the young people anymore. They're middle age. I know they're mad. Tell me, I'm still in my late 30s. Yeah, God bless you. But Moses just said three score and 10. If you get 70 years, what's the middle of that? 35. <laughs> I know I'm messing with y'all, but you're going to get over it. Yeah. So the young people are even below the millennials. Generation Z, they're called in social research. Generation Z. They're the people born from the late 90s up to 2015. Generation Z. And these young folk uh, need to learn. And and the millennials, even though you're in your 30s now, you need to learn these principles. I wish I had been taught them at church. Oh, I could have saved myself so much heartache. I know what it is to get in too much consumer debt as a young person, just buying everything. Just because you got a salary, don't look at that money and say, okay, what can I buy with this? That's the way we thought. And I was a musician, so I'm always buying keyboards. Oh, the latest. I had to get a Yamaha DX7 and I got to get a this and a that. and And I was playing all great. Other folk enjoying the music. I'm broke. How the blessing is that? They, oh, that man can play. Had me playing for all their weddings. Don't want to give me no decent money, but I got to play for everybody's wedding. Oh, I'm telling you where I came from. I play y'all love songs and y'all just bless y'all and y'all just sending me twos and fews. Talking about thank you. <laughs> I've been there, done that. Bought the t shirt. It's no fun. When you get a hold of stuff and you spend just because you got the money. And I want to encourage you all. Listen, generations X, Y, Z. And now you got the little kids. My grandson is less than two years old as I bring this message. And he's in a generation called Generation Alpha. Those are the babies right now. We need to lay a foundational legacy for these generations. Teach them don't buy it just because you got money. Let the pastor teach you what I wish I had been taught when I was your age. Just because you get it in your hand, don't say, okay, what can I do with this at the mall? Don't do that. The way to build your life with a strong financial footing and eventually be able to leave a strong financial legacy is to teach yourself to save some of it. You remember in Genesis 41 when uh, God had blessed Joseph and he's now the second in command in Egypt. You know all the hell he went through. But by the time he's second in command at age 30 in Egypt and he has this big promotion and Pharaoh just trusts him with everything in the nation. And Pharaoh told him, since the Lord gave you the interpretation of your dreams and the interpretation meant that there was going to be seven years of great fortune and blessing followed by seven years of extreme famine and poverty. And so Joseph went to Pharaoh, said, here's what we ought to do with that information. We ought to take the seven years of plenty and store up 20 percent. That's what it comes down to. Read Genesis 41 when you get a chance. Store up in those good years and it ended up being 20 percent over those seven years. So everything that came in, all this extra grain and wheat and everything coming in, Joseph took 20 percent of it and put it in storehouses. That's something you and I need to learn. Do now. None of us or few of us, if any of us can start out from this message, saving 20 percent. If you can, go ahead and do it. Pastor told me to save 20 and I can do it. Bam. Most of us. Uh, <laughs> what? Can, OK. All right, Pastor. All right. I want to have a strong God honoring financial legacy. Uh, I can't do 20. Most of us can't do 15 right now. Most of us can't do 10 right now. Come on. I'm just I'm working with you because I know you're trying to get out of debt and all this uh, Find some figure you are going to put aside, even if it's just 
you showing I'm teaching yourself the practice. Take something out of what you just got in that paycheck and put it in an account not tied to an ATM card. Oh, did I just help you? Clara over there helping me. If you tie it to an ATM, you are sunk. Because you're going to get in something that feels for a moment like a jam. And you say, oh. (laughs) Whip it out and go to the machine. No. Put it in something, one of these that's not tied to a card. Allies, one of the banks. There's a number of them. And it's a virtual bank. It is a bank, but you can't go to the branch. (laughs) And put it in there so that you don't see it. And even when you see it, when you go online and see what's in there, you got to go through, you got to type in, I want to take this out. And then they tell you when you'll actually get it because they're trying to help you not type in, give me that money. I just gave (laughs) y'all. I'm trying to help somebody. We'll be right back with more of today's Destined for Victory message from Pastor Paul Shepard, Senior Pastor at Destiny Christian Fellowship in Fremont, California. Listen to the broadcast on demand at pastorpaul.net. That's pastorpaul.net. Or subscribe to the podcast at Google Podcasts, at Spotify, or wherever you enjoy your podcasts. And stay tuned after today's message when Pastor Paul joins me from his studio. But first, let's tune in to the rest of today's Destined for Victory message, creating a God-honoring financial legacy. And you got to do it. Teach yourself to save something out of everything you get. Oh, come on, uh, baby boomers. If we had been taught in our churches, save something out of everything you get and put it where you can't touch it easily, if at all. Do you know where we would all be? Oh, Lord, y'all would. Y'all. Oh, uh, mm. So now I want to teach the generations following me. One of these days when I'm with the Lord and people are listening to my messages or reading my books and get these principles, I want them to say, thank God that man took the time. And instead of hooping and going into E flat in the pulpit, he told me how. (laughs) Nothing wrong with E flat. I can hoop with the best of them when I need to. But ain't nothing wrong with E flat. What I need to do is stay in a tone that's just talking and say, put something away. And teach yourself those principles, those practices. Put something away, even if it's not much. That's why all the financial leaders tell you, start with building an emergency fund. Most of them will say something like, get a a $1,000 emergency fund. You know why? Because I heard just the other day that one third, only one third of Americans can handle an immediate financial crisis of a couple of thousand dollars. A third. Everybody else will be like, oh, Lord. Well, I'm going to get twenty five hundred dollars. Shouldn't be. That's because we all out riding and looking good. Designer clothes on our backs. You need to go on. Just go head on into Target. <laughs> Come on, somebody. They got racks. Walmart. We got a lady in this church. Love Walmart. One of the women in this sanctuary loves Walmart. It's a blessing to her life. Don't y'all look at the first lady. What y'all doing this? <laughs> but she does. She loves Walmart. And she don't buy clothes there. I'm just, I'm just saying she loves Walmart for what it is. And sometimes when I see her buying things, I said, baby, uh, why didn't you let me know you needed that? She said, because you're going you to go get the more expensive time. I just know you. And she says, sometimes I don't need all that. I just, it meets the need and I'm happy. I married an unusual woman who really does not enjoy spending my money. Really, I married unusual. All my preacher friends, all my preacher friends are sick of me. All of them. You married somebody who don't want to spend money? So that's right, God gave her to me. <laughs> oh. We, I'm somewhere preaching, running revival. I said, baby, let's go to, into the mall. Whatever. I don't need anything. Do you know how many people would have said, fine, cool, let's go. <laughs> Preach real good tonight because I'm about to spend some money today. 
Save regularly. Put it away. Build a a little emergency fund. And then from there, just follow that. They'll give you strategies that are doable. And make this thing work for you. Save regularly. Number four, spend wisely. Spend wisely. You want a God honoring financial legacy? Yeah, you got to spend. You got to buy some things, but do it wisely. Luke 14, 28, Jesus said, which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? You got to pre-plan your spending. Do you know that's what budgeting is? Some people are scared of the word budget. Budget only means pre-planned spending. I thought and I prepared, then I spent. Nothing wrong with a budget. Budget's wonderful. You just lay it out. What do I need to spend this week in order to live my life? And you sit down and count the costs. Count the costs before you do your food budget for the month. Some of y'all go to work because your co-workers are always running out to the restaurant during lunch. You got to sit down, count the costs. The counting of the cost, plus you're already going to be putting something away. You should probably end up. After you count the cost saying, you know what? I can't afford out lunches in this season of my life. So what I'm going to do is bring my lunch in a brown bag. Because I went to the store, counted the cost, bought what I needed to buy. My baloney has a first name. It's O-S-C-A-R. Come on, somebody trying to help somebody. I know it doesn't look cute going in your little bag. Getting your bologna sandwich. Let them other folk go on out to the restaurant, flossing and carrying on. Floss on, y'all. I'm going to get my money together. And you know what? You get just as full on what was in your brown bag as you do or what was at the restaurant. Oh, I'm trying to. Quit looking at me in that tone of voice. Your needs are met. I can make it through with the energy. I can make it through the rest of the day. And all I did was brought this one bag. And that's it. And and let the other folk come in burping. Burping and broke. Come on. Oh, that's good. You should have. No, I shouldn't have. The day will come when if I want to go, I'll go. But when that day comes, I will be able to enjoy it better because I didn't have to stress financially to do it. Oh, this is good. Just because the ball said everything must go. You see them big stuff and they make the the biggest sign. Store closing. Everything must go. Doesn't have to go to your house. It must go somewhere. It's up to them where it goes. Because I'm walking by this because I came to this mall to get one item pre-planned in the budget. The stores are set up to get you. Come on, brothers. Best Buy is there to get us. Best Buy is set up to get us. You walk in Best Buy, everything flashing, big, loud, beautiful. Picture you never saw clarity like that in your whole life. Oh my goodness, you go standing there looking at this big old. (laughs) Sure, it's beautiful. Go home and watch the one you got. Because it's paid for. Amen. Amen. So we got to spend wisely. And last, set aside a legacy. Set aside a legacy. Proverbs 13, 22. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. But the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. See, a lot of Christians love that second part. The wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. I hear that priest all over the place. Well, yeah, that's fine. This is a truism in in Proverbs. Doesn't mean it's an unconditional uh, promise. Everybody can claim that wicked folk are going to give you a whole bunch of money. That's not what the Bible teaches. But the fact of the matter is. You got to look at the first part. 
Live your life so you can leave an inheritance for your children's children. You who don't have children, you got people who you, you speak into their lives, nieces, nephews, whatever. You got foundations you can support. God knows you got a, a church that's trying to help generations to come. Help us pay this stuff off. Whatever it is, there are ways you can leave an inheritance that will bless generations following. One of our sisters died during this pandemic, one of my early pandemic uh, funeral. She didn't die of COVID or anything, but just her time to go. And her relatives called me and said, Pastor, it was Sister Lily Ward. Some of y'all knew her. And Sister Lily, they called me when she was gone. I'm preparing to preach her her funeral. They said, just want to let you know, she left it perfectly clear in her documents, the trust and all that, that this amount of money that the relatives was hoping to get a hold of. She said, that's for my church because they're reaching generations to follow. And I want them to help it. So you got to think like that. What can you do that when you you do it here in this generation, it impacts generations to come? You got nieces and nephews, you speak into their lives, then go on and speak into their lives. And then if they're worthy, then you can lead them something. And you just got to know, you just got to determine that you're doing things that are setting aside a legacy that speaks loudly of your values and the kingdom of God. Thank you so much for being here today for Pastor Paul Shepard's message, Creating a God-Honoring Financial Legacy. As promised, Pastor Paul joins me from his studio in California. Pastor, your ministry to us each day on the radio and with various online sources for Destined for Victory is so encouraging. Now, one more thing you do, and you feel strongly about this, is the monthly encouragement letter that goes out to everyone. You want to say a word about that? Yeah, absolutely. The one letter I feel strongly about making sure we produce every month is an encouragement letter. And so I take some time and based on some teaching of that month, and occasionally it's not related to the teaching, just something that God's put on my heart in that particular time, I write a letter to let people know not only are we preaching messages, but we're really trying to impact your life and help you with application. Because again, our ministry exists to help people know God's Son, apply God's Word, and fulfill God's purpose. And my encouragement letter is designed to help you know Him, apply His Word, fulfill His purpose. And so I feel strongly about it. And I want to encourage people who are not on our mailing list to please take a moment and let us know, hey, I'd love to get the letter. It's absolutely free There's of no charge. no obligation for it. No obligation at all. We will take care of the stamp and everything. All you got to do is let us know. We can reach you. We'd be happy to send it to you. We can also send it to you by email. And it's important for you to be encouraged month by month. And so please let us do that. Get in touch with us. Give us your email and your mailing address so we can get in touch with you on a monthly basis. Well, the word encouragement means to give someone support and confidence or hope, sometimes all three. And that's what Pastor Paul seeks to do each month with these letters of encouragement. Sign up today at our website, pastorpaul.net. That's pastorpaul.net. And here's something else for you. When you send a generous gift to Destined for Victory, we'll gladly send you, by request, Pastor Paul Shepard's booklet, Creating a Relational Legacy. That's Creating a Relational Legacy, our gift to you today for your generous donation to Destined for Victory. Please call 855-339-5500 or visit pastorpaul.net to make a safe and secure donation online. You can also mail your gift to Destined for Victory, Post Office Box 1767, Fremont, California, 94538. Again, that address is Destined for Victory, Box 1767, Fremont, California, 94538. When you leave, what are you going to leave in the minds of people as they think about the relationship they had with you? What are people going to think about you uh, as a result of the relationships that you built while here on earth? That's next time when Pastor Paul Shepard continues his teaching series, Keeping the End in Mind. Until then, remember, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. In Christ, you are destined for victory.